Welcome to Life on the Rocks, your innovative entrepreneurship and motivational based show where we ask the real questions by tapping into the minds of successful, high performing individuals. I'm going to predicate to you that luck is an illusion, disproving the myth that there's a such thing as an overnight success. Get ready and strap in in three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming at you live from episode 90 of Life on the Rocks with your host, Connor LaRock. Today's featured guest in the hot seat is Mr. Vince Palladino. Vince, how are you? I'm great, Connor. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for coming on the show this afternoon. For anybody in the city of Greater Sudbury who currently doesn't know Vince, this gentleman is an elite entrepreneur and the owner of the Palladino Auto Group. First question I always like to start off, what got you started in business, my friend? Oh, that's a simple uh, question to answer. It was my father. I uh, grew up in the car business. He was a Honda dealer from 75 to 2000 and, and actually a used car dealer before that. And he, even before that, he was playing professional hockey, selling cars in the summer. So yeah, we've got, you know, uh, two generations, hopefully soon to be three. Oh, no, that's that's wonderful. Yeah. And then you look at the operation you have now. You have 10, 10, 10 different dealerships. Yeah. Talk about how you've scaled to that number because, I mean, that's not a simple task. That that takes a lot of effort, obviously. Yeah, it was, uh, it's, it's been, you know, I've, I've been the dealer uh, principal at Honda since 2000 and I think it took me about a decade almost to figure out the business and the model that I liked and I wanted and I thought we could, uh, uh, was good enough to replicate and would travel, so to speak. So um, I've been chasing opportunities in, uh, in the north for a pretty good period of time, probably about 2005 to 2010, and really couldn't find anything that I thought worked. Ended up coming across uh, Kitchener Hyundai, who what was on the market in uh, 2011, and that was our first acquisition. Um, Kitchener, you know, s- although a long ways away, a similar market to Sudbury, similar demographics, population. So, uh, and we thought the Hyundai brand was emerging at the time. So, uh, we took a chance with that. It ended up being a success. Uh, then I purchased Kitchener Nissan in that market, um, and actually went a- about a couple of years with those. Uh, two stores and, and sold them uh, back in 2013. Uh, came home and bought uh, Laurentian Chrysler uh, with Vince Policel, who's a partner of mine in a couple of stores up here. Um, and then it just, you know, uh, I think once you identify yourself uh, as, as a being a dealer on the acquisition front, the brokers in the business, it's a pretty active, active brokerage market. Um, so I started getting calls uh, really all around the province. and. Uh, I wanted to focus on the north as much as I could, being born and raised here. Um, so, you know, this has always been our primary focus, but we've owned stores in the Kitchener market. I currently own two in London, one in Toronto. Uh, we're also in the marina business and the RV business. So we own Walker's Point Marina on Lake Muskoka, which is kind of, you know, one of my uh, most prized right. possessions and something I did, never thought I'd get into. But uh, you also have a technology background as well. Like you did some software things as well. Yeah, yeah. We've I've had a, a software background. I was involved with a company called Vital Insight Group back in 2004. I think was my initial investment in VIG, and that was uh, basically taking surveys from paper based to online uh, and turning the you know the turnaround time for OEMs from 32 days I think on average it was to, to two days. Huge. And so um, exited that business in 2013. Uh, we ended up selling that to a, a private equity group out of New York City. And that, that's a whole other story, but it was a crazy ride and uh, happy to get out. But it was, it was in relation to the auto business as well, just basically a survey company. So we provided the short and long surveys for right. the manufacturers and for the dealers. And it was, uh, I was the original beta dealer. So I kind of worked on it with them and was asked to buy in, brought a few friends in. And so one thing led to another. I don't know if I'm a software uh, you know, genius by any means, but it was just in relation to our industry, so it worked out. But, you know, I think we, we love automotive, uh, but I also really like the RV business and the, and the marine business. And there's so many similarities between the three. It's uh, our, our auto group staff, which is based here at BMW, helps us manage uh, all three of those businesses. So right. I think uh, a lot of parallels and, and we've, we've grown a lot over the years. Uh, I had as many as 11 stores, recently sold Oakville Toyota in the fall. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, you know, we're buyers and sellers. We're always on the lookout for opportunities. And, uh, and you know, we, uh, we love running the stores. We're committed to uh, auto group, auto people, I should say. And, uh, and we got a real passion for the business. No, definitely. Talk about, so, so on the higher ends, I mean, you've said you've managed up to upwards of 600 staff. I mean, that's not, not everybody can do that. Talk about some of the leadership strategies and things that you guys do over at the Paladino Auto Group to kind of make things happen and be one of the best, obviously. Yeah, I, you know, when you scale that quickly and you're operating in that many markets with that many brands, I think what, what the commonality of all that, what, what becomes 
very quickly evident is that it, it takes people to, to get all this done. And, and it's got to be people that are like-minded, that understand my goals and my vision and where we want to go um, and, and see the business and, and the business world the way I do. So uh, people like us, I think, is a radio term, you know, I've inherited over the years. So definitely we recruit very well. I think uh, we've brought most of the people that are in this auto group in. We went after them, seeing them in their respective fields or in the community. Um, and I would say it's a team culture as much as it can be. You know, the auto group itself has, has had as many as 13 corporate staff. We're, we're currently less than that. But uh, I think anybody who's been involved with our stores and has been around us on a high level realizes that, you know, team and culture are really important to me. And there's, right. there's nothing I, I won't do to maintain culture. Um, you know, we've, we've made some tough decisions over the years to make sure that that culture is where it needs to be. And, uh, and we've also had some fun with it. But... You know, you, you win with people, that's nothing new. Certainly I'm not the first or the last individual that's gonna say that, but uh, having great people that are aligned and understand your goals and visions, I think is probably the most critical thing. Yeah. So you take the former CEO of uh, General Electric, Jack Welch, always said you wanna have a culture, it's like, like the party, everybody kinda wants to join. Yeah. And talk about how you've created that at the Paladino Auto Group. You know, there's a few rules we follow, and I think uh, when I, when in speaking with the GMs or any, any of the individuals, corporate staff or directors that, that have roles and responsibilities where they manage people. You know, I, I try to keep it simple and, and, you know, little things like, would you want to work for you? What kind of a boss would, do you think your employees would say that you are? Are you a leader? Are you somebody that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that moves their team forward, that makes everybody better? Or are you somebody that they fear? And right. so I, I always wanted, uh, respect over fear. I don't think it's a bad thing to have a little bit of an element of fear built into that, uh, but more from an expectation standpoint. I think everybody who uh, is, is involved with our group currently and has been over the years realizes that, um, you know, it's, it's a top-down driven strategy, right? I, I, I take great responsibility in ensuring that our culture is set by me and that uh, I treat people the way I want them to treat people. So, you know, our motto is basically take care of our staff and they'll take care of customers. So uh, we're not perfect for sure, uh, but I would say never perfect, always accountable. Right. And, uh, and I think great organizations have a really clear line and open line of communication. And I think when we're doing it well, uh, that's probably our greatest asset. Right. Have we always been like that? No. Uh, have I always been like that? No. Uh, and nobody's perfect, but you know, I, I like where we're going. I like what we've learned and I like how we've applied those you know, those lessons into our current modern day strategy. And I, and I think honestly, um, we almost have a, that kind of atmosphere that Jack Welch referred to. And I love, I love as a great leader and read a couple of his, uh, his books and, you know, I aspire to be at that level. Yeah. Um, but I would think that uh, at our best, that's pretty much how our stores feel. I think our best cultures feel like a lot of fun. I don't think people dread coming away. Right. I think they look forward to it. and they feel like it's something that moves them forward and enhances their life as opposed to uh, uh, being a drain. Kicking your feet and walking into work. Yeah. But you can see even just with the culture and how fast you've been able to grow that obviously people want to be here, it's, it's well. And something that I, I always like to talk about is the mentality. So yourself, you're almost a pro golfer basically at one mm -hmm. point. Talk about how you're, how almost like your competitive edge as a golfer has played in to yeah. setting the strategies, getting, you know, to want to compete and be better. Yeah, I was a very poor pro golfer, uh, financially that is. And, uh, you know, I had a decent amateur career. I went to Ohio State for on a golf scholarship and you know, my eyes were certainly opened up down there. I think we were ranked sixth in the country when I got there. I met Jack Nicholas in the first hour, played golf with his son for a couple of years. And you just realize you know, you're, you're, uh, you're just a, a speck of sand on the beach, so to speak. There's so many, so many great players. But I think what my, you know, I tried professional golf on the Canadian tour. Um, I think what my golfing background has brought to me is just the discipline and, and the, uh, the focus and, and not getting ahead of yourself. You know, I think the, the rules of golf apply in business uh, in that, you know, you've got to concentrate on the shot at hand and the, the most important shot is the next one, not the last one. So it teaches you to have a bad memory, uh, but it also teaches you to stay in the moment. And I think when we're doing it well and when I'm at my best, I'm definitely in the moment and just paying attention to the things I can control and not the things I can't control. So when you look at the current situation with COVID, um, all of the business owners in this country are facing the most challenging times they probably ever will and, and have and hopefully ever will. Um, 
so if you're if you're living in the past, uh, I think uh, you're you're definitely going to have a difficult time here. Uh, if you didn't plan for something somewhat along these lines, I guess you know nobody really plans for disaster uh, situations like this. But I think we've all had that you know doomsday scenario in the back of our mind in, in, any, in any economy. And then uh, if you're if you're too stressed out, you're probably living too far in the future. I mean, there's just so many things we can't control right now, and I you know nobody knows what this recovery will be like. Is it V-shaped? Is it U-shaped? Uh, is it a tremendously long and slow uh, you know haul back to where we we were? And do we ever get back to where we were? I don't know. But right. um, I think you know my golf discipline and what I've learned from my sporting life, playing you know AAA hockey growing up, and then professional golf and college golf after that has really just trained me to be uh, very mentally strong and uh, I think the greatest thing about golf you know that I always loved is when things are going poorly for you and you're standing out there in the 10th hole and you feel like you can't do anything right nobody's coming to save you right in hockey you can jump off get off the, the ice next line comes over and you know a lot of the times they'll save you but in golf it's an individual sport and nobody's coming to save you your, your caddies can't say much to you you're your father watching you and you know living that stress with, right. with you can't say anything to you so it just taught me that uh, nobody's coming to save you so you've got to get through these situations on your own and I think it prepared me for business probably more than than my schooling ever did no definitely mm -hmm. I relate to that too as a martial artist I used to fight in the ring and it'd be one of those things where you get a bad shot no one's coming in they could throw the towel but it's an ego thing and you're like oh no I gotta protect myself you're looking over your coach going on yeah what, what, what can you do for me but uh, we get up on the floor you know you never yeah. know yeah, it's a, it's a great blend. Individual, my father always said, one team sport, one individual sport. Uh, doesn't matter to me what it is. You pick it. If you don't pick it, I'll pick it. And I thought he was a professional hockey player. Actually played for about 13 years when the original six was around and made a good living at it. And, um, you know, he was a great team player and always the guy who got the injury in the last minute of the game right. kind of thing. So I love that spirit from him. I kind of tried to take that into my uh, professional uh, golf career. Um but you take those, you know, the, the lessons you've learned from both of those sports, whether it's team or individual, and boy, there's so many applications in your daily life, in your business life that uh, I, I preach that to my children and most of them, uh, you know, are involved in sports in some level and I think it'll serve them well in the future. No, absolutely. Do you believe, um, do you think entrepreneurs are made or it's one of those things that it came innate within you because you take your competitive edge with sports, being a professional golfer and then playing hockey. Do you think it's innate or you can make entrepreneurs or there's a kind of a divide? It depends on what level you want to be an entrepreneur. I think, you know, you, you, you definitely need that level to compete. I can honestly tell you, and, you know, I think I'm, uh, I'm one of the tougher individuals mentally that you'll find, but every day there's tremendous challenges in the business world. And, you know, my father warned me about that years ago saying, look, if you think your, your last challenge is, is you know, the, your golf career ending is the end of your, your competitive life. Wait uh, for COVID. Think again. Yeah, think again. <laughs> get into the business world and you'll find out. And he was right. I mean, it's it's 10 times the challenge. Um, but I think you've got to have that level of compete, that passion to succeed, that desire to be the best version of you that you can be. And then really you've got to, you've got to discover your passion. So for me, uh, when I got into the car business right away, I knew. I knew the first week. Uh, I worked for my dad sparingly through high school and I didn't mind it, you know, I was cleaning cars, I sold a few cars in high school, um, but really I, it certainly wasn't a passion for me at the time. I think when I was done with golf, I came back, sold a couple cars my first Friday, I got back and, you know, took my mother out for dinner and kind of the rest is history. I knew I'd found my passion. So you combine, you know, knowing what you really want to do in life, finally, right, at the age of 27 or 26, and then having that level of compete and then you take your experiences from the sporting world and you kind of put all that together. And, and I would think on some level, every entrepreneur has got an element of that, you know, involved in their, in their, you know, their past DNA, that's yeah. kind of formed who they are going forward. And, um, and there's some great ones out there and I've been fortunate enough to meet a few of them. Yeah, no, most definitely. Do you, do you have any se like secrets or tricks or things that get you over a fear? So, I mean, when you're doing a big merger or an acquisition, because there's a lot of risk involved being an entrepreneur, how do you get overcome that fear and build that mental toughness for people out that, that, there that are trying to take it to the next level, to be better, to be, you know, get out on the field? Yeah, blind confidence, maybe, I don't know. Um, you know, there, there, there's been deals that I wish I didn't do. Um, and there's been deals I've been awfully glad I did do. Uh, you know, I think you've got to set out with the idea that growth has to be what you want. Right. Uh, my days are certainly more complicated than they've ever been. So 
and you take time away from your family and your children that I think in a lot of ways you'd, you'd look back and think, Jesus, I'd like to get some of that back. Um, but you've got to want that. You've got to be ready for it. And uh, I equate it to winning. You know, I think when I stepped on the first tee in my amateur golf career, and I think I had a pretty good one and I was never the best, but I think anybody who played against me would say I was pretty tough to beat. Um, I was ready to go through what it took to win on the first team. And I could almost see in my competitors whether they were or not. So I think in business, um, that that becomes evident. I mean, you really see who's, who, people who say they want to grow and those who actually set out a plan and, and, and a course of action and attack that and, and then embrace the challenges and embrace the, the fear and the stress and the anxiety because my family will tell you that They've seen me live through a lot of that, but um, you know, you've got to. You, it's got to be what you want to do, and it's not for everybody. No, most definitely. And something that when it comes to fear, so I always have two two different things. I always say, so fear is just a thought. Thoughts can be changed. And the other thing, so you look at you know high level entrepreneurs and peak performers. They have rituals. They have things they do. So you start your day. Let's say, for instance, you work out. In a lot of ways, though, you see fear take over where people are like, I have to do this thing before this doesn't happen or I can't get in that elevator. It's superstition. It's fear. Mm -hmm. So so it's one of those things that I think as an entrepreneur, being able to overcome those barriers is super important. So a guy like yourself, I mean, to go to the level you are now and then still be growing, it shows in your team everything you do. I, I just want to commend you for that. It's, that's difficult. It's a difficult mentality to, to be able to have every day. Do you have any rituals or things that you do on a daily basis to quote unquote prime and position you for, for the, the, the day? Um, yeah, I think like in our business life, we definitely have, uh, I, I've always like to say we start our, our day better than anybody in the car business. I think we, um, we run a series of huddles in the morning. So by department, I think our, our primary huddles at nine o'clock is a dealership group. Uh, and then by department, I think we've had four huddles by that point in time in most of our stores, some of them five. Uh, where I've always felt like meeting in person, there is no substitute for it. I mean, I understand, you know, COVID situation right now, we've got to do it via Zoom and whatever else. And there's some benefit in that, but I'd, I'd much rather be in the room with somebody and see their, you know, see the reaction, look into the whites of their eyes the best I could. Uh, but I think as a dealership, we've created the disciplines that, you know, when I first started being a manager, I'd have a tough time getting everybody there at nine o'clock. <laughs> and I used to say to them, look, are, are you a hockey fan? Are you a sporting fan? You, know, you go to watch the Patriots play and they say kickoffs at seven o'clock. The, the players don't show up at seven. You know, they've been there since two prepping. So when I look at the business world, I try to use as many sports comparisons and analogies as I could. Um, so I think our level of preparedness and the way we start our day uh, by the time that 9 o'clock bell goes off in sales and the 8 o'clock bell in service, um, I would say we're as or more prepared than any uh, group or set of dealerships in the country. And I think my peers would tell you that. So my staff know, you know, our discipline is is that. I think as a professional athlete, I learned, and I remember my coach at Ohio State once talking about Tiger Woods. He had just come on the scene in, in his freshman year and I was a senior. And we said, hey, coach, what do you think about Tiger? And he said, well, um, uh, I know that uh, he's more talented than anybody in the van here. You know, nobody said a word. We go, yeah, I can't, can't, can't disagree with that. He goes, but here's my thing. He's more talented. He works out more than you do. He's in better condition than you are. He practices more than you do. And from what I can see, he wants to win more than you do. And, you know, silence fell in the van in a pretty accomplished group of players. And I think we, we got what he was trying to say. You know, what, what are you willing to do to be the best? So... None of us at that point uh, became uh, anywhere near uh, that level or got to that level. Uh, Ryan Armour was one of my teammates at the time. He was in that van. He's, he's on the PGA Tour now. Um, but when you look at that in the business world, that's kind of my challenge to our team is like, who do you want to be and what are you prepared to do? I'm one person within the Paladino Auto Group and I might steer a lot of our direction, but collectively we got to make decisions as to who we want to be as a group and how we want to be perceived and in this city and in the, in the cities we do business and by our customers and as I say we're not perfect by any means but uh, but I think we're as prepared for success as anybody in the business that I know. 100% I think that's really that's a really good point because people have this movie idea where you're magically going to step into a moment and, and you're going to perform better when it's it, if you look at the military strategy that people use it's you're going to only be as good as what you've trained for. It doesn't just magically turn on. It's the same as a martial artist or a fighter. You're not just going to hit that drive out of the park. Yeah. So, so I actually, I appreciate that and like that. I want to talk about, so something important being in car sales, like starting out. So a lot of your guys coming in, 
there's a sales stigma in general. Whenever somebody's a salesperson, mm -hmm. talk about how you overcame that stigma to then obviously grow your business and, and do better. Because there is people out there that, are like, well, you know, sales maybe isn't the, the road for me. When it's a really good way to learn how to communicate, to deal with people, to negotiate, to give, to, to help people in general. So talk about that. Yeah, like I really enjoy sales. So for I never saw it as something that was cheesy or underhanded, and that's that's never the way we've done business. I'm sure there's. You can point to any industry and, and, and you know highlight the individuals that weren't doing it right, but I, I felt like I brought a level of professionalism to the car business that that very you know I think I hadn't seen on much of a level when I got involved with it. I mean, my father was very disciplined and had a great core of individuals, so I learned from from a lot of really uh, professional individuals when I first started out. Um, but I think it's it's how you go about it. I mean. Selling and adding value to somebody and making sure that you put them in a better scenario than when you found them, that's fun. That's not selling. I don't, you know, after that, we're just trying to make sure that we've got you in the right vehicle. It's, it's, uh, you're in a payment scenario that you can afford and that's not going to break you. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of customers that can pay cash for vehicles. Well, we've got a lot of customers that are using Paladino Lending Solutions to start out or to rebuild their credit. So we're just trying to put people in, in, in vehicles and solve problems, I guess. So it has a lot to do with the people that I've recruited to be in this business because I've, I've very rarely hired individuals from other dealerships, not to say they weren't great or they wouldn't fit, but I like people to, to learn business the way that I want them to learn it. And we very much run it like a team, like all of their data every morning is up there. They, we see their traffic analysis. We see their non-purchase. My salespeople have to speak to their you know, to their pipeline in the morning huddles. Um, and so we share data, we're transparent, um, and we work as a team. And, and I think, you know, when you actually are thinking long-term in the business, you know, sales, just to sell that first vehicle, that's great, but it's a thin margin business and we don't make a lot of money off one sale. We profit from lifetime ownership and multiple uh, transactions. So sales for me is about, uh, I think it can be cheesy if you don't do it well, and it can be underhanded in any industry, whether it's real estate, insurance, vehicle sales, uh, you know, brokerage sales, you name it. Uh, but you can point to that in any industry. I think we do our best to hire credible individuals, train them properly, and have them uh, be invested in seeing value for our consumers. No, absolutely. And I think that's a really good point because again, as I always do my research for these interviews, I look into the marketplace. So I'm looking at the automotive industry and in some ways you look at some other dealerships where you could see you could see the examples online of people that'll go in and they'll try to they'll charge you extra and put you into one specific vehicle. It's like, well, this is all we can do. So you take an example of somebody maybe that went bankrupt, they're at a disadvantage, they're they're, they're just struggling in their family, so they're embarrassed and they don't want to come in. So something with your the the Paladino auto, or Paladino uh, Auto Group that mm. brings people in like a family. You have a program I, I was doing some research on called Paladino Lending Solutions. Right. So talk about how you welcome those people in and it's not just to push you in a vehicle. They give you selection, we're here to help you, get you lower, get, get you a lower interest rate mm -hmm. and then be able to, to go off of that. Paladino Lending Solutions was really born from our, our maybe lack of ability to get credit challenge customers into vehicles. We're very much, you know, dealing with the, the, the prime banks and, uh, and our, our captives from our lenders, whether it's Honda Credit or BMW Financial Services. And, um, you know, we, I, we were, the, the bucket was full of holes, so to speak, right? We were losing a lot of customers that would have happily bought our vehicles, um, maybe didn't come to us because they didn't feel like they could get credit uh, from one of these big shiny dealerships. And they thought they had to go to a used car uh, dealership, which nothing wrong with those. And they, they serve a purpose and they do a good job. But, uh, and we come from it, that was my father's background. But I think when I really looked at, you know, credit challenge customers, it was this prime and subprime division, like as though there, it was cut down the middle. And then you started to spend a little bit more time in the subprime world, so to speak, and realize that there's legitimate issues why customers end up in that bucket, right? Um, life events that are beyond their control a lot of the times have pushed them in that direction. So we kind of saw based on our, our size and our scale, if we got into that business, um, maybe we could do a better job of it. Maybe we could um, have more leverage with the lenders based on this, you know, the volume of roughly 10,000 vehicles sold within the Paladin Auto Group in a year and all the business that we're sending these lenders. Maybe we could uh, have greater optics based on each market that we're in. And, uh, and maybe we could enhance the ownership experience for them so that 
you know, if you, if you took away the division of prime and subprime and just said, look, they're customers, and based on credit, your rate's going to be based on credit. And we'd all love it to be 0%. Geez, I'd love all my loans to be at 0% and all my dealerships and all my, all my real estate. That'd be fantastic. Uh, but that's not the case. So, um, you know, where, wherever you lie in, in the spectrum of interest rates, um, we felt like your ownership experience post-transaction should be better than it was. I think the, the, the typical subprime customer wasn't receiving the treatment that our prime customers were. And if you're willing to pay for service once you own the vehicle, I, didn't, I don't see the distinction, truthfully. And, and so we wanted customers to, in this bucket over here, that were credit challenged, you know, typically for good reasons, to be treated like this group of customers. Because after sale, once the banks decided what the appropriate rate was and we brokered that deal, after that, they're just a customer. And our service departments don't see uh, any difference there. They're gonna follow up with you, they're gonna provide you with our shuttles, with our loaner vehicles, with our concierge, valet, pickup, drop-off service. If you're a used car customer, you can still sit in our new car showroom. Uh, there is no delineation between those two customers anymore. And so with that in mind, we, we really kind of ventured into Paladino Lending Solutions. I brought uh, a friend of mine in, Guy Robinho, to do some research on that industry and really try to understand it before we got into it. And uh, what we discovered was there's a tremendous opportunity there. There's a lot of deals that we were losing that were falling out of our bucket because we couldn't get you approved at TD or RBC or one of your banks or one of our lenders. But there were all these you know, 15, 20 lenders over here that were willing to do business. And yeah, it was higher rate than you wanted, but you know, it's, it's rebuilding of credit is the way we look at it, right? You start here and if you can make consecutive payments for some of our lenders for 12 months, then we can talk about flipping into another vehicle or another loan where there's a tiered structure for rate. So it was uh, kind of a, you know, one of the companies we're involved with called Return to Prime. It was kind of a return to prime philosophy and saying, let's do a better job over here. Let's try to get these customers back over here. But in the interim, let's treat them like we treat everybody else. So uh, it's been a great win for us. The, uh, I think the feedback's been phenomenal. It's seamless. You don't go down the street to a, you know, to a different building because your credit's poor. You're still doing business. Paladino Honda booked uh, over a couple hundred loans last year that were, you know, would have been otherwise in subprime. And so you stay with that salesperson. You stay with that financial services right. manager. You don't leave the dealership. You're not being treated any differently because you shouldn't be. And in fact, you could argue we might want to amp up that level of treatment because yeah. the rate you're paying is even a little bit higher. So those customers have proven to be great service customers. Um, so we, we see it as a whole new avenue uh, or a whole new section of the business, so to speak, or division, because uh, we weren't paying attention to it for almost 20 years. And, and right. we definitely are now. I think that's crucial that a lot of people believe that the easiest way to build credit might be through a credit card. But like you had said, it's probably one of the easier ways is you get a vehicle, you make those payments on a monthly basis, you can upgrade. So I really think that's a great aspect too, especially with that stigma in dealerships. You never know, like when you go into maybe like the rickety down south, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not going to name a name, but I went down south one time and I was going to buy a vehicle and uh, they gave me a hard time and they just tried to give me this, this really high interest rate. It was terrible service. They didn't walk you through. Whereas you walk through your doors, it feels a lot more like a family. Your sale, I know a bunch of your sales sales guys too, they're all good guys in a good way, they're there to, to do good work. So, so I think that's, that's important. Uh, to change gears a little bit though, so talking about the changing market, talk about how your business has been affected now that we everything's went digital, it's, it went faster where now you don't have to go through signed paper, I can send you a document, get the deal done, the car's to your house. Like talk about how your business is, is stay at the forefront. Yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, unfortunately we're not as far down the path as an industry as we'd like in that regard. Um, there's still barriers and regulations as, in, in, as to how we can go about transacting with you online. Uh, the banks still require wet signatures, which means that we need to see you sign. Uh, and it's a KYC, know your customer. So unfortunately, there's a lot of fraud going on, uh, especially now. It's really amped up. So uh, the banks have certain requirements. Um, OMVIC, which is our governing body for uh, Ontario Motor Vehicle Industry Council for Ontario, requires that the transaction be done at, the, at that place of business, so an OMVIC licensed facility. Uh, so as much as we'd love to tell you that you can buy a car online, you know, soup to nuts and, and, and pay for it and not interact with any of us if you didn't want to, and we would just provide that delivery service for you, um, that's not the case. So. I think you'll see those barriers fall as time goes on. Uh, they, they have to. I mean, I think the customers demand it, and especially post COVID, you know, the sensitivity to uh, just the exchange of germs on any level. It's, it doesn't have to be COVID. I think we've all learned a lot from that. And I come from a 
bit of a germaphobe background, so uh, I'm the guy who doesn't touch door handles and, and do all that. But you know, and I think in our close quarter working environments, we're going to uh, we're going to see customers uh, continue to want to push uh, down that path a little bit more. So I think it'll it'll kickstart the the e-commerce revolution, so to speak, in the car business. But we definitely have some regulations that need to fall before we can fully take it from top to bottom, which. Uh, which we hope, quite frankly, uh, we can come to the right agreements with those governing bodies and and the, and the province and in our banks and our OEMs and and get to the point where we're satisfying customers because because uh, I think they'll demand it. No, hundred percent. I think it's important, especially with this COVID shock, that you see that everything is going digital as much as it can, and then with those changes, hopefully that'll push some more momentum in the industry. Yeah. I want to. This is important just for the younger, like uh, the younger, but the, the maybe newer entrepreneurs out there. What would your advice be? So something like COVID hit. Everybody's affected, obviously, by it. What would your advice be for those businesses that are struggling, trying to just stay afloat? Whew, that uh, it's a challenge for any industry, I'm sure. sure. I, I know in our industry, I think because of the size and the scale of it. I mean, the banks have you know focused divisions within the banks for automotive. So, I think there there are a lot of uh, ways for you to potentially um, preserve cash flow. Um, you know, this the uh, the curtailments of, of vehicles and our, our operating loans and our floor plan loans. I mean, we've, we've seen deferrals from the banks and it's a, it's a big industry. So I think you've got more cooperation in our industry. I feel for the small businesses. I mean, I think the, you know, the mom and pop type businesses, uh, people put every last dime into them, whether they're, you know, uh, restaurants or, uh, you know, service business uh, orientated. I just, uh, I think it's going to be devastating on, on the Canadian economy. I think, you know, in our in the dealership world, I don't think you'll have as many casualties as you as you might in other small businesses. So, my concern, if you know, if I'm uh, if I'm speaking uh, openly here, I think is that the government maybe didn't react as quickly as we needed them to, or maybe aren't getting the funds down to these businesses as quickly as they need to. Um, organizations of our size, you know, have so many levers that we can pull and things that we can do to generate cash and working capital, but. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, these wage subsidies are a great example, not to stay in the moment too much, but uh, that's been a long time coming. So right. I can tell you what it would mean to our organization on a monthly basis. And if you take that forward three, four months, the, those those uh, results can be devastating. So definitely need to see some of that money start to flow. Uh, but I think it's changed the way all entrepreneurs look at their business. And, I, you know, you, you talk about the rainy day fund that my father always lecture me about telling me about you know 19 20 21 percent interest rates and you know what he's seen over the years and i thought ah Dad, that's you know, it's never going to happen to me what, what do i need to worry about that for and clearly i'm fairly aggressive in the acquisition market so uh <laughs> you know i don't my cash doesn't sit idle for too long and we continue to try to uh, to grow and i kind of liken that to a you know a poker player so to speak right. you know, I'm, I'm not letting the little and, and large blinds come around and take cash i'm usually keeping chips on the table so um, yeah, there's scary times. Uh, I just uh, I hope cooler heads prevail and the banks assist in, in uh, ways that they need to to keep businesses alive. Definitely, no, I think it's important, and I want to transition off that question. So, talking about education, so you look in some ways, and again, I'm a big proponent of self education. Formally educate yourself as best as you can, but it puts these students into a massive debt ratio, right? You go out there, you have forty thousand dollars in debt, and a lot of them don't find jobs. So with the digital age coming forward with everything, what would your advice be to those students if they don't really know, they're like, ah, I wanna be an entrepreneur or, or I wanna be an engineer. Like what's your advice to those students, especially now uh, looking back? Look, I think education is critical. And I, and I, you know, in that position with my daughter right now who's applying to universities and uh, is going away in the fall, uh, my son's a year away. You know, my comment to them is, is it's not so much that I, I have an econ degree. I, I don't rely on that often here in the business world. Um, but it, what it, it was a test. It taught me, look, here's an assignment. Uh, here's the issue. Here's the problem. Can you figure it out? What would you do to solve it? Um, you know, in some of my business classes, and those are the ones I enjoy more than anything. Uh, so, you, you, you know, it's, it's a test on your, uh, of your ability to, you know, consume information, to, to you know, to uh, synthesize that, to, to put it on paper, to explain your ideas. Um, how organized are you? What skills will you take with you? So I think education is critical, uh, but I don't think it's going to solve all the issues for you in the business world, for sure. No matter what degree. My, my eldest daughter is incredibly intelligent. She's, she's uh, probably going to go to one of the best business schools in the country. And that's going to be one 
you know, really valuable education. Uh, but she's still going to come out into the, if she chooses the business world after, she's still going to have all the challenges that you're going to need time in that business to deal with, right? There's no degree that's going to teach you that. Uh, but I think it, it shows your ability to be disciplined, uh, to manage your day, to, to, to basically grow your mind, right? Like it's, uh, you can jump out and get into any industry you want, but, uh, and there's a learning curve involved with that. Uh, but I think you can underestimate what an education, what a good education will do for you. So yeah, certainly some money wasted out there. A lot of our staff, you know, don't have education, uh, formal education post-secondary that, that are incredibly successful and we're poor students, you know, believe it or not. Uh, and then there are those with degrees that are just mediocre. Right. So it doesn't guarantee success, but I don't think it's a bad thing, that's for sure. No, for sure. What's, what's one of the major characteristics you look for when you're hiring somebody? So something. the reason I bring up the education question, we look at it, well, if somebody has an MBA, but what happens if you have somebody, so they're going for the same position and obviously you want to generate revenue. You have someone that's a really good salesperson. They have a track record. What would you look for if you, you had those two coming into your office? Do you look for the degree or are you looking for the character? What, what's one of the variables? And again, it's a loaded question, but I just want to see kind of the process when you're bringing someone in, what you look yep. for. The degree helps. I mean, it shows that they can overcome a challenge and they have the mental capacity to do that. If you listen to a lot of the, the hiring and, and HR pundits out there, they'll tell you, uh, intelligence is the most important variable, not character. I disagree. Uh, I'm a character guy. Um, Me too. <laughs> I choose character first and foremost. You know, it's it's that it's that old sports analogy, right? That individual wasn't the most talented individual in the league. I remember watching Nick Felino once for the Wolves, and he was a captain, and I was listening to one of the scouts saying he wasn't fast enough, right? He wasn't quick enough, didn't have enough foot speed. Well, the guy's a captain in the NHL now, so. Uh, and I know Nick's trainer really well. I know Nick a little bit, and that's just just pure character, right? Like, right. just comes from a great family. You're Mike Felino's kid. You're going to be chalk with determination and great character, and uh, he's one of Sudbury's greats. And and so, he, you know, I I felt like saying, well, then you don't know what you're talking about, and you don't know the family. Right. And so, when I when you can make a character decision like that, and you know the individual. Um, uh, you know, I think you're always going to be in a better position and, and hiring. I think the most difficult thing for us is as we scale, we go into all these other communities. We don't have those relationships and we're hiring from, you know, all the websites that everybody else is looking at. And you make a lot of mistakes because typically the people out there are looking for jobs are the ones that weren't successful at their current employer. Right. And, and uh, you know, the Eagles, as they say, aren't the ones that, uh, you know, that, that are looking for jobs. They're flying around enjoying life. And, and those are the ones that we've got to try to, recruit um so i believe in recruiting um and i and i believe in uh in character i think if you sit back and wait for people to show up and save the day you look at our organization and the true leaders within our organization they were recruited we knew them um, we had some sort of uh, one degree of separation so to speak which is great in the north in Sudbury. and you want to find out about somebody that's what i probably call one individual knows that individual knows the family and so we placed a lot of stock uh in that and, uh, you know, and after that, I, I, I got to be honest with you, I love hiring athletes. I mean, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> if I've got two resumes and I've got one with a better education, but one with a, you know, probably a higher level athletic background, uh, I'll choose the athlete all day long. Right. So I think that's crucial. So you talk about, so, so if you have the athletes, they have the mentality, something I've noticed in your leadership style, that's important. You can just see as a business is your emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. So talk about the importance of emotional intelligence in business, being able to relate to people because at the end of the day, I mean, you could have the greatest business in the world that's selling, but if you, you have people that aren't good and they're, they're not pleasant to other people, it's not going to, it's not going to grow. Yeah. You know, I have, I've never heard a phrase that way, but it's, it's a, it's a pretty interesting take on it. I think, um, when we're at our best, we're coaching our staff and, and our people uh, to the greatest degree, and we've got them in the right mindset. You know, I think uh, right back to the sports analogies, like a, a great coach has got all, you know, 15, 17 players on the bench on a hockey team. He's got each one of them in the right uh, mind frame. You know, they're doing the right things off the ice. They've got a healthy attitude about the position that they're in. They, they're good teammates. They're driven. The whole bench is aligned for a common cause. Um, and, and those are great leaders in my opinion. So I try to treat it like, like sports. Uh, I admire those positions. I'd love to be a head coach and, and, and run a team like that. Cause you know, I think, uh, although Mike Babcock's, you know, reign in Toronto wasn't great. I'm an afflicted Leafs fan, unfortunately, but, uh, like my brother. You know, he, he, he made an interesting comment when he first joined, he said, you know, 15 different players, 15 different ways to coach. 
So I don't think you can take one coaching style and apply it to all of my GMs. Let's say I've got 12 GMs. Uh, and I, my, you know, my comment internally has always been, I can't get to all the staff. There's 600 and some in, you know, six cities and, you know, around the province, but um, I can certainly coach the coaches. So I spend time trying to make sure that those individuals understand my philosophies, the way I want them to treat people and to handle situations. We run into some difficult ones, obviously. Um, you know, not everybody's uh, aligned with your cause and, and, and doing the right things every day. So in an organization that size, uh, you know, some of the stuff you deal with, unfortunately, is, is from a disciplinary nature and HR standpoint. But um, for the most part, you know, once you get your team settled, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing when you acquire a, a dealership and typically an underperforming business, whether it's in the arena business or the RV or the auto business, what's broken is the culture. It's not the systems. Uh, they actually on paper might look great. It's the culture, right? It's it's the team. They're not aligned. Uh, they don't believe in in leadership, and maybe leadership is is at fault in that case. And maybe they haven't been transparent enough or shared uh, you know information. I think one of the strangest things I've seen in business over the years is how managers want to keep information to themselves and make themselves all knowing, and and you know share little bits and pieces with their employees and and criticize them. Uh, after a period of time from not understanding what they know, you know? So I, I think when I became a professional manager, so to speak, I kind of realized like, we've got to do a better job of being transparent and our team need to understand our goals clearly defined and where we want to take this business. And then let's, let's see if they even want that. Do you want to work extra hours? Do you want to be elite? Do you want to bring more money home for your family? Is that, is that a goal of yours? Or are you just happy with a nine to five? And you're really just looking for consistency and, and you don't want your day to be disrupted. You don't want to come out of your comfort zone. So I think when we're, when we're acquiring, uh, typically over the years, I've acquired underperforming stores because I felt like from an investment standpoint, I could buy them at a discounted rate. I could grow them and then I could sell them for, for a bigger number. And I've, I've been successful in a few of those uh, uh, you know, sales over the years. And I look back and think of the job we did more than anything wasn't better advertising and it wasn't different tools. It was, we changed the culture. We went into a broken culture. We identified who was not going to follow along with our principles and our values and our goals and beliefs. And we got rid of those and parted ways with those employees, brought in people who we thought were like-minded individuals, chose character over experience uh, and education. And, uh, and chose uh, the most competitive team we could. And so whether you're in service, sales parts, F&I, um, a lot of these pay plans are variable pay plans in our business and, and you've got to come to work and, uh, and grow your department and do, you know, serve people well so that they have a great experience so that they come back so we can grow our business. Absolutely. And, uh, and so it's always customer focused, uh, but, it's, but it's definitely broken cultures that we fix more often than not. And that's been the key to success. One of my friends, he's a good friend out in California. He focuses specifically on culture because there's such a, a gap. You see a big divide in people and then businesses that are thriving. Mm -hmm. um, Vince, I want to ask you an important question. This is for the people out there that maybe are watching the show that are struggling. They're going through a hard time. It may be quite possibly they're just trying to look for the next thing and they want to get to the next level of their life. If you could go back, what would your advice be to yourself? Like what's some of the best advice? And again, not to be loaded on that, but what would be some really good advice that you would give to those people struggling, just trying to get a leg up and do better? You know, I, I would say, don't be afraid to change. Uh, if you're not happy where you're at, then try continue to try to find your passion, whatever that may be. It's the way I, you know, uh, coach my children and saying, you know, you might want to be in the, in the auto business. You might not, you might want to be involved in one of our companies one day. You might not, uh, but whatever you do, find your passion. Uh, and then from there, I take my father's advice and his father's advice is like, whatever you're going to do, whatever you choose and, and whatever career path you take, try to be the best. I'm not saying you're going to be the best, but go into it trying to be the best. You want to be in construction? Be the best construction worker you can be. My, my grandfather was a stonemason, built a lot of the Dunavan uh, in his spare time after working for Inco, right? So he wanted to be the best stonemason, eventually ended up going in business for himself. and. You know, so my father was the same thing, got into the car business, didn't know much about it. It was just selling cars in the summer and, and quit professional hockey and uh, got an opportunity with Honda and, and he had grade 10 education, but he wanted to be the best. And so, you know, he, he, he got himself to the point where he was, I think, one of the only import dealers that didn't change hands in the city. And it's a great success story. He got me involved in the business. So um, try to find your passion. And I think when you do that, 
it's like finding an interesting subject in school. You're going to be a better student. Right. So you keep going until you find your passion. And, and that doesn't happen right away for a lot of people, right? I have a lot of staff, uh, very successful senior level staff that make a better living in the car business than people might think. Um, that went through a couple of career changes to find, you know, what, what was important to them in life. And, and so I think our group provides a lot of that coaching and guidance. And a lot of the times we part ways with people, it's almost amicable. So we've got them to the point where they realize, you know what, this actually isn't for me. Um, and so we want, you know, I think it's going to be a win-win. Um, but uh, finding your passion is probably the most critical thing. And look, there's going to be a lot of opportunity post-COVID here, right? There's going to be, there's going to be people that have been sitting at home and really, uh, you know, reflecting on their life and their choices and deciding to go in a different direction. And I think a lot of business owners are going to go through that as well. I think what was important to us coming in may not be as important going out. Um, so there'll be tremendous change and I think there'll be tremendous opportunity, but uh, I'm an entrepreneur, so I always see the silver lining right. in, in things. And, uh, but I, I, believe in, uh, I believe in a better world post-COVID than we were when we went in. No, I agree 100%. And a good metaphor for you, probably like, everyone's like, is the glass half full or is it half empty? We sold the glass, you know, that's the opportunity. <laughs> that's always a good one out there. But uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, one of the last questions I want to ask you, because I think it's important. So so you can see yourself, very successful elite entrepreneur. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, maybe somebody's driven for money, this and that. Obviously, that's not the case. You're driven by your passion. And one of the biggest things I see with elite level entrepreneurs is the giving back to the community. So I want you to talk about the importance of giving back to your community and how that's played a role in your life to even make you that much better of an entrepreneur and bring more people in. Well, you touched on the money. And I mean, I think that everybody perceives anybody who's driven in business to be very uh, driven by the money. I, to me, the money's the byproduct. I like it, I like to spend it. I like a little bit more, uh, you know. Uh, I like that blazer, that's why. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a spendthrift than some guys in my industry, but I figure I work pretty hard for it. So I like the houses, I like the good things. Uh, but I think you got to, you've got a responsibility to the community community from you know with which you earn that living. Um, so I've always tried to uh, be involved in as much as I could be uh, at the time. There were years where I couldn't give much to local charities because I quite frankly wasn't making all that much. Uh, and there are periods in my in my career where I've been able to give more than than most. So. Um, you know, we're, we're aligned with too many charities and organizations to even talk about, but uh, I just feel a responsibility to our community. I try to keep it local. Um, you know, obviously Neo Kids is more popular than, than most of our uh, contributions, but we do contribute to a lot of other charities. And I think when they're local and they benefit the communities with which you derive your income from, uh, that's important. And we're, you know, we're doing our best to, uh, to be involved in the right things in the London area. Uh, where we've got two businesses, uh, you know, and, and so wherever we're doing business, uh, we try to, you know, contribute to that, uh, to that local charity base and uh, try to find something that, you know, we're not gonna spray and pray, so to speak, but we try to find one or two that we really like and, and that I believe in and that I think are doing it well. And, uh, you know, so Neo Kids was, uh, was our, probably our largest local initiative. Great. Um, and I like the idea that I've had three children that have all accessed uh, Sean Murray's uh, services, Dr. Murray, who's uh, a real gift to the city. Um, and so the more I learned about NeoKids, I just felt like, you know, we need to band together and do something for the community. And I don't know if that's going to be a standalone facility like it originally was, was talked about or if it's going to be a wing within the hospital. But, you know, uh, suffice to say, we know it needs to happen. And if you've had your children go to Toronto for any reason, and I, you know, with 600 families in our auto group, give or take, there's, there are unfortunately issues with children uh, pretty much at all times and staff that are requiring that type of uh, care. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, we bend the rules, so to speak, to a system because you, you, most of it you can't get done in Sudbury. So, Absolutely. you know, my speech at a couple of our Neo Kids golf tournaments has always been around, you know, we've all got Torontoitis, right? We want to travel to Toronto and spend money there for whatever reason, almost an excuse to do so sometimes. And this is an opportunity for us to to look at our own community and, and, and try to uh, pay attention to what we require up here. And I think Neo Kids is a big initiative that needs to get done. I think that's a great point. And even with you look at COVID, like you were donating RVs as well. And a good way to leverage your business at that point too, to be able to let, let people in the hospital if they need a place to go. I thought that was really a really good initiative. Yeah, there's so many great Sudburyans. I mean, I've probably never been more proud to be a Sudburyan than I have been in the last uh, couple months of just... Uh, what I've seen our community do and, and the way people are rallying behind other people and those in need, I think is really critical. I mean, 
for me, it's I don't think the RV initiative was much, but uh, for me, for I was yeah, looking, I'm like, that's good. <laughs> you know, but it's it, it look it, if it if we can those those trailers were sitting there basically. You know, we're paying floor plan on them, but you know, if we could assist somebody and, and have their day just uh, be a little bit better and have them maybe be uh, more well, you know, rested and, and ready to treat the the sick and uh, then we were happy to help out, but there's there's tremendous need all around our community for charity. I mean, you look from better beginnings, better futures, to coats for kids, to you know all the, all the great local uh, charities where the, they really require help. And so, what I think is going to be scary in in COVID and post COVID environment is I think the charities are really going to be in a tough spot. Um, and so, it's I think it's kind of up to organizations like ours to continue to support where we can. No, 100%. My last question for you, um, just to close this off. So so with all this stuff, we talked about the community, we've talked about your business, we talked about Paladino Lending Solutions. What can we expect next from you as, as COVID starts to unveil? Or do you, I, I know, I just to get inside your mind, like they're planning, obviously, you're doing more acquisitions. Are you looking to go into any other industries? Like, is there anything that, that's near and dear to your heart that you're looking forward to? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what I can share with you is I think you'll see us attempt to diversify uh, going forward. I think, you know, an automotive portfolio is, uh, is uh, important to our overall goal. And, and I think it's critical, but I, I do, you know, there is disruption coming in our business. Um, so I think this probably sped that up a little bit. I think the e-commerce uh, direction is going to really grow and, and take flight now. And I think you'll see, you know, backing and funding and, and, and a real focus on that going forward in any industry, let alone ours. So, you know, you've got the Elon Musks of the world trying to go direct to consumer. You've got the manufacturers talking about e-commerce. I think our, you know, is it, is it overnight? No. Uh, are car dealers going to be here 10 years from now? Absolutely. And are we selling all electric vehicles versus internal combustion ice engines? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's up to the individuals to make decisions as to who produces what. But I think we'll play a part as a dealer. You know, your community dealer, I think, is going to be there for the long haul. Uh, I think we can, I truly believe we can assist the manufacturers in doing a better job of, of change uh, and getting to consumers the, the way that uh, they want to. But I will say that I see uh, consumers, you know, if you look at our, we couldn't test drive vehicles for a good period of time and, and nobody was happy about that. So customers still want to come and experience that vehicle, the affirmation, confirmation, engaging the five senses, sitting in the driver's seat, listening to an expert, uh, you know, talk to them about maybe the second largest purchase of their life. Uh, so I see car dealerships as extremely relevant, but I think you'll see PAG uh, continue to chase uh, opportunities in other verticals and, um, and continue to, to, to diversify. And I, and I think anybody in my position would be lying to you if they didn't tell you, you know, they're considering buying and selling, right? I think your, I think your, your acquisition strategy now becomes a little bit of both. And, and the big publics have talked about that uh, in the U.S. Where, where typically that model is a little bit more mature than Canada. So we only have one publicly traded auto Canada in, 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 the, in this country, but there are many in the U.S. And they've all signaled, look, we'll buy, we'll sell, we're, we're here to listen. Uh, but I think what anybody in the industry is talking about right now if, if they're connected is potentially diversifying and and i, and I think uh, if i did it right um, maybe we play a little part in that disruption going forward and and so i'll, I'll leave you with that and that could be uh, fuel for an interview down yeah there. no absolutely I, I just want to say i want to commend you for the the incredible job you've done even for an entrepreneur like myself it's inspired me to get to a level like that it's it's incredible especially locally i think a lot of people have this idea in their mind that People from Sudbury can't be big shots or go out there and do big things. And, and you are living proof of that, my friend. So yeah. I want to say- Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I, well, I, I, the headaches that come with it. But no, I want, I want to say thank you, Vince, for coming on the show this afternoon. And uh, uh, thank you for tuning in to Eastlink TV, guys. Thanks.